put together the uh, Internet for Everyone uh, initiative, and we're excited about it. It's an unprecedented initiative bringing together public and private sector groups to raise public awareness about America's digital divide and to build the political and popular will to address the problem. We start from this simple premise. To fully realize the net's potential, all Americans must have access to a fast, open, and affordable internet. Today, they do not. The U.S. has sunk from fourth to 15th in the world in broadband adoption since 2001. We're here today because we can no longer leave this critical issue in the hands of Congress or the phone and cable companies that have dominated the policymaking process for years. We're here today because we can no longer leave this critical issue in the hands of uh, the, the, this, I'm going to go to the next line. <laughs> you know, it's funny, as, as I started, I was like, how can I make a joke with, on this subject of internet, internet adoption? And, and, and that was fortuitous. Dis, <laughs> despite common misconceptions, the digital divide is not shrinking. According to our research, right now half of the country does not subscribe to high-speed internet. As remarkable that, as that is, with everyone on here right now probably checking email or looking at a website instead of listening to me. Americans pay far too much for far too little compared to consumers in other countries. And it's the middle class and the less fortunate who are falling behind. The divide is not just economic either, it's also geographic. Nearly 10 million rural households are in areas not served by any broadband provider. We're here today because the future of the internet is the future of nearly all media. Television, radio, phones, movies, and emerging technologies are all moving to a digital platform. That's a big deal. And we know that the policymakers are going to determine the future of the internet with it, the immense social, political, and economic consequences for generations to come. So with so much at stake, closing the broadband digital divide must be a national priority. One of the biggest obstacles to adopting a national broadband policy is that the internet is not seen as a political issue. And even if it were, today the community that uses the internet is not sufficiently organized to guide the policy debates that will shape its future. That's why Internet for Everyone is here and being launched today. The initiative is organized around four core principles. The first is access, that every home and business in America must have access to a high-speed, world-class communications infrastructure. Number two, choice. Every consumer must enjoy real choice of high-speed internet providers to achieve lower prices and higher speeds. Number three, openness. Every internet user should have the right to freedom of speech and commerce online in an open market without gatekeepers or discrimination. And fourth is innovation. The internet should continue to create good jobs, foster entrepreneurship, spread new ideas, and serve as a leading engine for economic growth. Internet for Everyone does not support or oppose specific legislation, but rather presents these principles as the foundation of a national broadband plan. Internet for Everyone recognizes that it is outrageous that the country that invented the internet cannot ensure fast, affordable internet access to all businesses, all hospitals, all schools, all libraries, all churches, all public safety officials, all community organizations. Internet for Everyone recognizes that to close the digital divide in this country, we must dramatically change course. For years, U.S. broadband policies have supported a rigid duopoly of cable and telephone giants, and our rapid technological decline is the direct result of these disastrous policies. Getting us back on top will require a, a national broadband policy framework that supports broadband competition and open access, and we need bold leadership willing to reject the conventional political wisdom and explore innovative solutions. Internet for Everyone launches today to empower such leadership and realize an internet system that works for everyone, rich and poor, urban and rural, today and for generations to come. To start, Internet for Everyone will hold four public forums across the nation to get ordinary Americans involved in crafting a national broadband agenda to close the digital divide and reestablish America as a global leader at the same time that we build one of the largest public interest industry coalitions ever assembled. The time for this work is right now, and Internet for Everyone is pleased 
to have some of the leading minds in this nation here to endorse the initiative and help us get started. Thank you very much. So um, I'm Brad Burnham. I'm with a New York-based venture capital firm called Union Square Ventures. Um, we fund applications layer innovation. And so that's um, things like Google, Craigslist, Facebook, um, not infrastructure, but applications layer. We're investors in companies like uh, Delicious, Etsy, Twitter, Tumblr, Indeed. May, some of you may have heard of those. Um, we are sponsor we're supporting this initiative because we are huge fans of decentralized innovation. We believe in uh, open innovation as social policy. It's also very, very important to our business. Um, the bottom line is that in an open marketplace, um, any new business must create value in order to be successful. In a closed marketplace, or in a marketplace that's dominated by uh, a gatekeeper, uh, the gatekeeper has an obligation to their shareholders to extract value from the franchise that they have. We believe that as a nation and as a, an economy, we do better when everyone is innovating to create value. So you can look at this as a, a national competitiveness issue. We find that as venture capitalists, we are, we are now looking to Korea in the gaming world or Europe and Japan in the mobile world to find innovation in those worlds uh, and, and import that back into the U.S. And we think that's probably not a healthy thing long term. Or you can look at it just as a, uh, as a social good. We have, you know, we're a wonderfully blessed country. We have enormously well-educated population. And to hobble that population by controlling access to innovation would seem to us to be a real crime. So either way, we think an open internet is the right policy. Thank you. Next we have, we have Robin Chase. I'm Robin Chase, founder of Zipcar and founder and CEO of GoLoco. Um, I agree with everything Brad says, so I won't speak to those points. You know, why internet for all? Um, I think internet access is required for full participation in society today. Um, maybe it's not as basic as water, but it's definitely as basic as hot water. Um, my personal focus work is focused on climate change, and I see low-cost and ubiquitous internet access as fundamental to leading a high-quality life with low CO2 emissions. Um, in particular, in the transportation sector, Zipcar would not exist without <coughs> access to internet, and those people who don't have access to internet, Zipcar does not exist. Um, Go Loco, which helps people arrange to share rides quickly and easily among friends, getting at the high cost of fuel today and a solution for the people in rural areas is completely dependent on internet access and people able, being able to connect. Um, I think the future of transportation is going to involve our ability to be able to move quickly from, book, from bikes to feet to transit to cars to rail, be able to make all those payments seamlessly and to know the time and the schedule and to be able to do it on the fly. All of this requires internet access. I think there's no participation in our society today that's full participation without internet access, and we can't innovate appropriately without these things. So I am really behind this movement. Thank you, uh, FCC Commissioner Jonathan Adelstein. Well, I'm uh, something of a frustrated policymaker in Washington. I'm, I'm frustrated because uh, it's clear that what we're doing in Washington isn't working as we fall behind the rest of the world. <clears throat> Eight years of inattention, benign neglect, and short-sighted policy choices have left the U.S. trailing uh, global leaders in virtually every metric that counts. Uh, broadband penetration, availability, competition, speed, and price. What we're hearing at this conference is that the internet is reawakening American democracy. But for it to reach its highest potential, we've got to make it accessible and affordable to everyone, truly high speed, and open and neutral. We need a national broadband policy. Now, we at the FCC regularly hear from the giant telecom and cable companies that we oversee and they're an important part of the picture. They drive deployment, they make the investments that make the systems work. But our job as a government is to serve the public interest. We need to engage the public to ensure that their voices are heard. That's what Internet for Everyone is all about. A truly successful national broadband policy is urgently needed, but it involves a broad coalition. It involves, hopefully, a consensus. I think of it as a three-legged stool. You have businesses who will invest uh, and Deploy, drive deployment. You have government on all levels, hopefully working in concert, 
and you have the public, both directly involved and through public interest groups like this coalition. Uh, Internet for Everyone is part of making sure that that third leg of the stool is strong so our policy serves everyone, including the public, along with the big telecom companies. Yeah, I'm the uh, president of the Writers Guild of America East. Um, <clears throat> as you know, the Writers Guild of America East and our sister union, the Writers Guild of America West, <coughs> representing 12,000 writers of television and motion pictures and entertainment and the news, took on the big international media conglomerates <coughs> going on strike for 100 days. We struck primarily for representation in the internet and in new media. And in the asymmetrical warfare of that strike, our members were able to utilize the internet with wit and ingenuity to win. So as we create new entertainment and news for the internet, we want as large and as diverse an audience as possible. And the best way to do that is by supporting internet freedom, access to high-speed internet for everyone. That's why we're here today in support of this exciting new initiative. And as we go forward, we'll be working with other unions, other members of organized labor to get them involved as well. Thanks. All right, we're going to just move down to the end here for just a second. There you go. For, we have, uh, because Professor Zittrain has to, <laughs> has to leave a little bit early, we're going we're to jump the queue here. Sorry. <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> uh, Hi there, uh, I'm Jonathan Zittrin. I like all of these people. I support everything that they're doing. Uh, the internet is a collective hallucination, a really good one, but it doesn't obey the normal laws of supply and demand in certain important respects. Just think about the fact that if you want internet access the standard way, you pay for it. That's called transit. If you want to share with three of your friends and you all collectively use more bandwidth, you pay more. You get more friends, you pay more. You wire up the whole city together, and it's free because now you're peering. That's weird, right? It's like the graph of expense over bandwidth goes up until it's so high it drops to zero. That's the cool thing about the net. And that's the kind of thing worth talking about, worth exploring, worth seeing how to preserve in models that have lots of different entities, so many of whom are represented here working together. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Here you go, Tim. <laughs> Sorry. I thought it was going to go like. We could do that too. Okay. <laughs> I, was started, I started like doing other stuff. Uh, thanks so much. And also free press. Yeah. Um, I also like everyone on this panel and agree with them. I just wanted to point out something a little different. Uh, namely, how much we pay for bandwidth and how little we get. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of attention in in the media and among regular people on the energy crisis right now and, and the focus on just how much Americans spend for energy and oil and, and so forth and, and how this is affecting the whole economy. But we have a similar kind of problem with bandwidth and I don't think we always notice this. Americans spend over $100 billion on cell phone bandwidth alone, for example, right now. When you add up the amount of money that an American family spends on, on their internet bandwidth, on all their cell phones, and, and uh, when you add it all on telephones, add it all together, it's almost as much as people spend on energy. You know, their car and their heating oil, it's almost about the same number. And like oil, I mean, there's some difference. It's, not a, it's a renewable resource bandwidth. And it doesn't create pollution the same way. But it has this in common with the, with the oil problem. Production is controlled by a tiny cartel that sets prices high and keeps them there. And so we have a similar kind of economically structural problem with bandwidth in this country that we have with oil and energy in the world. And part of what I think this coalition is doing is to expose the fact that we have a bandwidth crisis that in some way is similar to the energy crisis today, and that something needs to be done about it. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> That's cool, Tim. My name is Vince Cerf, uh, and I had a little bit to do with the beginnings of the Internet, so I have a couple of things I'd like to suggest. First of all, the notion that Internet is for everyone is not a new one. 
please see RFC 3271, written in April 2002, titled Internet is for Everyone. Uh, second, in 2008, it may very well be that we should say Internet is for everything, because we're going to find things as well as people on the net. When the Internet was designed, it was intended to have open standards so that anyone who could follow the standards and build a piece of Internet could connect up to it. And that design practice has led to rapid proliferation of multiple implementations and owners and operators of parts of the Internet. It was designed without any particular application in mind. There was no primary application. And it was a system that permitted permissionless innovation. Just try it out, put it on the net. Nobody has to tell you whether you can or can't do it. The consequence of that is that this network is different from the other purpose-built networks of the past. The telephone network was designed and built to carry telephony. The cable system was designed and built to carry television. The internet was designed and built to carry anything digital. It doesn't have a specific application, and therefore it has lots of them. The consequence of that is that the business models that are associated with the internet don't match the business models of single-purpose networks. And therein lies a real conundrum. Rick Witt and I prepared a paper called Horizontal uh, Regulation. I'm sure that Commissioner Adelstein has seen, or is it Adelstein or Adelstein? Adelstein, Adelstein has seen this uh, and I hope has given some thought to it. I submit to you that the internet is not something that should be regulated in the same way that the vertical regulation uh, has uh, used in the past. Finally, I want to point out that what's critical about all this is that freedom is about freedom to choose, to choose which carrier will carry your bits, to choose what services you go to and where they are in the net, to choose what equipment you use and what software runs on it, to choose what applications you want to run. All of those things are heartland from Google's point of view. We think the net needs to be open, accessible, affordable, and all those other wonderful things that have been mentioned so far and we support this initiative. So I'm a little lost because I don't have slides. Um. <laughs> power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. But it's... <laughs> but it's Keynote, Vince, it's not PowerPoint. <laughs> So, uh, so let, me, let me adopt the slide style. I just have one word, infrastructure. Yeah. Infrastructure. Say yeah. You've seen my slides, right? Infrastructure. <laughs> infrastructure. This is social infrastructure. And what's bizarre about where we are in the history of building infrastructure is this is the first time We've tried to undertake the building of fundamental social infrastructure against the background of a Neanderthal philosophy, which is you don't need government to do it. Government has no place in this mix. We can do this all without government doing anything. Now that Neanderthal philosophy has governed for about the last eight years. And it has allowed us to slide from a leader in this field to abysmal position. And it's about time, and I hope this initiative helps us get there, where people recognize that, of course, the private sector has a role, a central role, maybe the most important role, but it's never enough. And the government has a responsibility to make sure that this, the leading technology nation in the world, is not embarrassed by the key technology, key infrastructure that is central to much more than private enterprise, public interest, social interest, cultural interest, personal interest, all of these things drive the necessity of the net. And we need a government that can get us to a place where all of these interests are reflected in the net. Infrastructure. <laughs> Well, I have to follow Vent Surf and uh, Larry Lessig, so I'm going to be extremely brief. Um, well, it's really common sense to me as to why Republicans would want to support the Internet. And that's largely with the fact that 50% of America still doesn't have access to a high-speed Internet uh, connection. And that's largely rural America. In fact, that's over 10 million households. So when President Bush secured 
of that vote in 2004, and when we continue, Republicans we, continue to lose elections by one, two, ten percent, it really, really concerns me because I want to start winning again. Um, and the second point, which hasn't been brought up yet, is I'm 29 and I'm an entrepreneur, and so I'll, I'll speak for Gen Next and, and millennials who aren't represented here, who are the generation below me, but 70% of high school students want to be entrepreneurs. And that's the highest number that it's ever been at all time. And they're not thinking about starting a barber shop. They're thinking about starting a Facebook. And they're out there trying to be creative and clever. And they understand that their idea matters. And there are people out there in, you know, instead of, um, you know, it's inner city kids, it's urban kids, suburban kids, it's kids all over the world who are thinking the same stuff and dreaming the same stuff. So that's why I'm here supporting this effort. Thanks, David. Uh, last we have Van Jones of Green for All, then we'll, we'll get to questions. That's good. That's good. Um, well, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm very, very happy to be here. I, I want to, first of all, uh, uh, testify, as Josh said, that the digital divide is alive and well. Uh, I have to confess, when I got here, I uh, saw a bunch of people that were standing around talking. They were all talking about Twitter. And I said, oh, Twitter bird. I thought I saw a putty chat. And, <laughs> And they said, no, that's a tw tw tweety, tweety bird. And I, said, I said, oh, I'm behind the curve. So there's a, a whole section of people that have not even caught up to where we are now and are in grave danger of being left behind. And there are three reasons that's important. First of all, the right to vote uh, is diminished when people don't have access to the blogosphere and all of the discussion and the debate uh, that goes on. Uh, the right to survive, we saw in the California wildfires, uh, those communities, those people who had access to good information at the drop of a hat could figure out if they were in danger and get out and survive. Those who didn't, mostly Latino farm workers, were burned alive in the California wildfires. It's a matter of life and death. Um, also with the economy, uh, we're working to build an inclusive green economy, uh, but it's hard for people to find a job they don't know about. And so the opportunity to have equal uh, access to the workforce increasingly depends on equal access to information. So both for our democracy, uh, for our survival, for our economic opportunity, we need internet for everybody. Thanks. We're going we're gonna to now go to, to questions. I'd ask you first to identify um, your affiliation and also to tell us uh, if it's uh, uh, someone on the panel, which person you, you're asking the question of. Oh, we'll start in the back here with the, the pink shirt. Sorry, right here. Yeah, it's you. Yeah. Basically, as everyone in this room knows, this is an enormously complex field, and it is virtually impossible to come to the table and say, here are the exact policy recommendations that we have for you, especially given the big changes that we're going to see in leadership over the next uh, six, eight months. So this, rather than do that, what we're doing instead is laying out a baseline, because I think you'll find in these four tenets of access, choice, openness, and innovation, that is a fairly solid set of principles around which this coalition can then say, well, that fits this, this, this guideline or it does not. And so it's a way that we can create the biggest possible tent that would that be able to embrace everybody who's got a stake in the internet. You know, at the FCC, I've got a stack of proposals on my desk for a national broadband policy, and they tend to follow along s certain lines. I could lay out for you right now what a national broadband policy would look like, and they would be consistent with a lot of the different proposals I've seen. What we're lacking is the leadership to actually implement those policies. We need to have coordination that requires leadership between all levels of government, between the private sector, and between the public interest groups and, and the public itself. What we need in order to get that done is exactly this kind of, a, of a, a movement, a kind of a coalition that can bring together the public voice and ensure that that's heard as we look at all these different policy proposals. There's no want of proposals, there's a, a want of willingness and leadership and, a, and commitment to actually implementing a policy. 
Uh, I have a question for uh, Commissioner Adelstein uh, about that stack. One of the areas that I worry about is this question of competition. We don't have a great deal of broadband competition right now. If you look at uh, the choices that people have, the, at best they seem to have a choice of cable uh, modems or something coming from the telcos, uh, DSL or fiber. Uh, is it possible that we won't get much competition because every time you try to introduce facilities-based competition, you're competing with somebody who's already there, therefore you're sharing uh, the market, and that's not as attractive uh, as the uh, state of affairs as it is today. So I guess I'd ask Commissioner Adelstein whether you think there is a way to cope with that, or perhaps you disagree with that analysis. Just really, this is great. The panel is going to start asking it ourselves, and we'll, we'll get going for a while. Uh, I think that uh, every one of those policy proposals that are legitimate ha involve competition as a central element of a national broadband policy. There's nothing that will better drive innovation and lower prices uh, and ubiquity of service than competition. Where there isn't competition, we need universal service and government subsidies to make sure that there is service. But competition for uh, this is, is urgently needed. Over 90% of residential broadband is from the cable companies or the big telecom companies. I believe wireless is the greatest avenue for competition. I'm not sure that the policies we have pursued have succeeded in, in, in ensuring a third channel into the home over uh, wireless. And spectrum policy is a central element, and competition policy is a central element of every uh, valid proposal for national broadband policy. Um, we're, we're running a little over time, so we're going to take a couple more questions, and then the, the speakers will be available for person-to-person -person follow up. Um, I think you had the next question here. Well, if you look at the fight over media consolidation, we were up against those very same powerful companies, the most powerful uh, the most powerful industry in America, the media, which politicians tremble in fear of, was basically held uh, by the public, working with free press, working with public interest groups. The people won out over the most powerful industry in America because we stopped the attempt to roll back our media ownership rules. That same spirit that mobilized the movement against media consolidation also drives the move for internet freedom and for ubiquitous widespread broadband deployment. It goes back to the same American spirit that we want to have decentralized, localized, uh, rooted in the community media that responds to the needs of the community. I think we're tapping into something that is really a fundamental part of the American spirit and that uh, no politician can easily ignore. Uh, the writers, we took them on directly. We took them on directly and while we didn't get everything we were after, we did get a lot. And the way we were able to do that was by using the internet itself that they were not, you know, as, as much profit as they see in this, as much growth as they see in this, they still don't really know how to use it. And we had the creative minds with us who were able to do that. And I think the members of that coalition, of this coalition, will be able to do that as well. break these down, comment on them, give you the kind of support and information that you really need to help you make those decisions in the, in the FCC. The, the, the FCC hasn't made any effort to involve the public in a discussion about what a national broadband policy would look like. We don't, uh, the majority of the FCC apparently doesn't think a national broadband policy is necessary. Uh, me and Commissioner Copps believe one's necessary. I think that kind of a discussion would be very beneficial. I, I think if you're going to have a national broadband policy with public buy-in, you need to involve the public, and we need to have all of this discussed out through a, a, a wiki-type blog, blogosphere where we really listen. It worked in the media ownership debate. I think it can work here, too. including the fourth estate were dominated uh, by entitlement and privilege of basically one race. 
how, how do we reach out and incorporate and promote um, other races and cultures and also from the settled scene and anywhere else? For us, uh, diversity is an enormous issue. And uh, West Coast, there, there are committees in, that are working on that. They are working steadily on increasing employment uh, in, for minorities and for other people uh, in the business. That's something in the East that has been a little dormant. It's one of the things that, under my presidency, I'm trying to increase. And we are, in fact, setting up a, a, a whole new group to, to deal specifically with issues of diversity. Well, the FCC has really neglected uh, diversity, uh, both in the media and in other aspects of the industries that we oversee. I mean, we, uh, we basically just allowed newspapers to buy uh, television stations and radio stations with, before we really took steps to improve the diversity of ownership of media outlets, which is abysmally low. Uh, women own 5 to 6 percent. They're over half the population. Minorities, maybe three or four percent, and they're a third of the population. So we, our policies are out of whack. I think we need to uh, fundamentally address this issue. Uh, hopefully, the having an open and neutral internet can lead to a more representative uh, a sector of the population being able to really participate and engage. Because we're seeing in the old media, in the mainstream media, that the ownership is incredibly concentrated uh, without adequate diversity so that the media doesn't look like America. So we're, we're running over time, um, and some of the panelists here are actually speakers in other sessions that I think may have already begun. So we're going to only take one more question. I know there was a question in the back of the room. Kurt. All right. Uh, Andy. Yeah. Hi. I'm Andy Carlin with NPR. And full disclosure, I used to run the Digital Pride Network as well. Um, I guess the question about education is I know it's far specifically about the infrastructure. But when you look at the data that like the NTIA and the Cuba have produced over the years about where the digital divide exists, it seems one of the greatest correlations between who has access to who doesn't is an education level. So I'm just wondering, how does education work? Well, maybe I'll start to. You know, if I'm not mistaken, generally the more education you've attained, the higher your income. And one of the things we've accepted in the United States is just that bandwidth is incredibly expensive. You know, we've accepted the idea that people that, that uh, because of this fake idea of spectrum scarcity, for example, that it's reasonable for people to spend hundreds of dollars for reasonable cell phone service, hundreds of dollars for cable service, hundreds of dollars, you know, 50 to 20 to 50 dollars on internet service. 50 years ago, Americans paid almost nothing for bandwidth. Um, now, partially a lot of things hadn't been invented yet, so <laughs> that's one reason. But there is this fact that we've just accepted that bandwidth is something, and because I think we've just given into this model, that bandwidth is something that American families will spend hundreds of dollars on per month, right? Uh, and that, that, and that, in fact, some people say it's a good thing because the industry is worth billions of dollars. But when a basic commodity like that is expensive in oil or in energy, we say need, something needs to be done. We have not done enough to reduce the price of bandwidth. And I think if people, I think, then with lower incomes would be able to afford this stuff. And I think that's where it starts.